All right, good. All right, you guys, so uh, so super glad everybody's here. Uh, uh, good you guys are all staying safe and not coming out here, right? So we are, um, right now, we are just at the mouth of the Santa Ana River. So Eli's from Orange County. A couple of you guys are from Orange County, but, but um, uh, I hope you had a chance to look at some of the drone footage from yesterday that I, that I posted. If not, when we're done, I um, want you to take a look at that. Um, one of the, this is a really uh, modern, a classic modern challenge for us right here, right? So this landscape is heavily fragmented. This landscape is heavily altered. This area where I'm standing right now, you guys can see this, right? Sandy Beach, right? Sandy Beach. So this, is, this has been Sandy Beach forever. We historically have had a lot of micro dunes over here, right? Or, or, or a lot of dune systems. You can see right over there with this, behind where this gentleman's walking, there's some vegetated dunes. Should be much more expansive. Not as expansive as Ormond, not as expansive as Manhattan Beach and some of our other dune complexes, but nevertheless, there were some decent sand dunes uh, complexes in this area. But then also we have this huge uh, year round perennial water source, right? So big river. So we know this whole area was full of wetlands, coastal salt marsh. And so that area has been um, uh, uh, heavily altered. And so when you look at that drone footage, in particular, I put some of, of dog, the area behind Dogs Beach, which is a big oil production facility and, and all that kind of stuff, really sliced, right? We have our Sandy Beach, and then we have PCH, and then we have usually pretty intensified development, either housing or in the case of the oil and gas infrastructure, you know. Uh, uh, pads, hardened, hardened infrastructure, and then maybe some wetlands, right? Um, so really, really fragment this up very, very much so uh, 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 bathtub rings away from the ocean. Okay, so now we have this oil, okay, and the other by way of introduction, lots of historical oil, oil and gas. We've been talking about the oil and gas production in Santa Barbara and Ventura counties, but also there's a, a large history, a long history of oil and gas production here in in Los Angeles and this part of Northern Orange County. Um, we typically hid those things. We typically put sculptures, we typically put uh, palm trees, we typically put these kind of other um, 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 structures to hide the, the derricks and the pumping and stuff like that around here. But there's always been a lot of production here. Much of the remaining well, uh, much of the remnant wetland and, and wetland transition zone was former oil and gas production facilities that they've now abandoned have, have, have allowed to go back to conservation type of type of stuff. So um, so anyway, so here we are. So we're right here. Let me turn so you guys can see. Okay, so we're right here. So now uh, I have this in the lab. Uh, man, I'm going to dip down here so you guys can hopefully see this. So um, oil's coming ashore, right? So a couple deal, a couple things. So first and foremost, we want to keep the oil away. So right now it's about, uh, and if you guys, if, I, if I'm talking and I'm pointing to stuff and you guys can't see it, just unmute and tell me, hey, Dr. A, we can't see what you're pointing to, okay? Otherwise I'm gonna assume you guys will be able to see stuff. Okay, so right here, right here, it's, uh, what time is it right now? We're recording this, it's, it's about 8.40 and I, I, I'm, I'm zooming with my phone so I can't look at my tides, but it's about, I wanna say it's about a, about a plus five, Point one or so foot uh, tide right now. It's rising. It's going to be rising for another hour or so. When it's when it's completely high tide today, that'll be a little bit shy of plus six feet. So we have another foot or so of rise of tide. As you can see right now, the tide is starting to come up. It's starting to hit this area. If we have oiling, if we have sheen, if we have tar balls, that's where the so it's going to be floating and it's going to come up here, right? And so right now, if we look, we can see this scuzz line. Right, so we can see this. We can see this scuzz line of foam, and uh, and and that's going to be floating stuff. So that foam is basically dead animal snot. It's a technical term, mucus. Uh, and so and so that floating stuff is going to be left here. As the floating stuff comes up, the tide goes down. It, it's stranded. And so that's the concern with oiling, right? So the oil is going to be floating. It's going to be coming up. It's out in the water. It's doing its stuff. It agglomerates, it bumps into other dropules, uh, makes bigger, bigger ag aggregations, and now it's going to be able to stick to things more easily. Tide comes in, it's floating, it's doing its stuff, then the, the tide goes down and it's deposited on the sand or the critters or the vegetation or the, the rocks or whatever it is, right? And so that's the worry. So um, 
this area here does not normally look like this. So if we look this way, it, you guys look like you're, it looks perhaps like you're looking at a dune or so right there. That's an artificial dune that was constructed in the last couple days. The goal for this was to be at least five feet high, about 20 foot wide or so. And the idea here is just put a, a, put a cork, put a cork in the river. So we wanna make sure that when this, when this uh, water is coming up like right now, it's going to not get into that channel. Initially, what happened was water is getting in, water or oil, excuse me, got in here. So water, or, or, there's definitely contamination farther in there. Not massive, it's not the end of the world, but there is contamination in there. Um, and so uh, what happened was, if we look at this channel right now, right, we can see these rocky boulders. Then there's, that's PCH where those vehicles are, are traversing right now. And, you know, it's a classic urban stream, right? Classic, so it's highly channelized. It's either concrete or rock rip-wrapped on the edges. And, and I don't know this for a fact, but I think I know it. I don't know it's true, but I kind of know it's true, if you know what I'm saying. So what happened was they probably said some poor, some poor dude in public works Saturday, Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon, like, dude, go put a boom out there. And the dude is like, what? It's like, yeah, I don't, go put a boom out there. So they went out, they put a boom. We'll talk about how the boom technology works in a sec. But he went out to go put a, a barrier and probably tied off over there, you know, like say on, the, on, on one of the boulders or one of the bike path poles, strung the, the material across the other side and tied the other side up over there, right? Um, Well-intentioned, not, not, not ill will, not, not lame person, just what we normally do, right? And so if you, typically when we're trying to do things like capture trash, which is what we oftentimes use these booms for in these settings um, because of, of pollution, we don't want to get plastics and everything in the ocean, et cetera. We do that and that's probably okay for that large macroscopic trash. But for stuff like oil, that sucks. That doesn't work, right? So, so what we have is we have the boom over say 90% of the water surface, in this case, the Santa Ana River. But then on the edges, right? The rope's going up, right? The rope is tied to the to the uh, the anchor point, and so there's maybe I don't know what it was five, ten feet or so where where the boom is not touching the water. Game over, right? That oil is just going to hit that and go right around and go inside. So if we don't have complete sealing off of these of these areas, the oil will absolutely get in. Not 100% of the oil, but the majority of oil will get in, and then it defeats the purpose of having these booms. So okay. So, so that's what's going on here. So they initially put those, they initially deployed booms, weren't working super well. And they just said, hey, this is, we don't want to mess around. We want to be just super solid. So we're going to actually make sure nothing is going to go wrong. If we have a winter storm, if we have a big rain event, whatever, we want to make sure nothing is going to, we will not have contact surface water connection with air, with the ocean. And so that's why they built this berm. Um, and this, we just call this a temporary berm. If it was for longer, we call it a seasonal berm, but this is just a, a, an emergency berm will not screw with any fish, will not screw with any critters. This is these, these structures seasonally, it's very common in Southern California for our, our water structures to seasonally close. Um, we have bar built estuaries and the like. So this is not, this is not uh, you know, catastrophic or killing critters or anything of that nature. Okay, question so far, I'm, I'm, I'm talking, but is this all making sense? Is anybody awake? Does this making sense to anybody? It's good. I got a question. Yeah, Kurt. Um, so or Jack, next whatever, whatever week on, on Monday, there's a big storm coming in. They're predicting like six foot plus waves. Is there, is there anything they're planning specifically for that? Like, are they trying to meet a deadline to do something before the storm comes in or <clears throat> anything along those lines? Yeah, I don't know specifically, but I, I suspect that's, what part, that's why this is 20 feet wide and five feet high, right? Or, or, or plus five feet above mean high or high water. So I suspect it's because of, of worries for that. Although when they started the construction, when they started doing this, um, I don't know if they knew exactly that there was a storm coming on Monday, but I think the fact that a storm is coming on Monday is most likely just making them work more, more quickly and more fast. Um, but but I, don't know, I don't know specifically if they've changed anything because of that storm, but, but I, I will try to find out. But good question. Other questions? Okay, 
Um, okay, so, so let's review the general approaches that we want to do when we have an oil spill, the general management approaches. First and foremost is we want to stop the crap, right? We want to stop the badness. And so that's going to mean we want to, if it's a, if it's a broken open container, we want to sort of get that container, that ship, that vessel, get it righted and, and make it so it's not spilling the rest of its contents. If it is a blowout, um, uh, such that we are constantly flowing water, we want to seal that break. So the first priority is always to stop the introduction of additional oil. Okay, so that's first priority. Next priority, once we have that done, um, the next is we want to contain the oil, ideally not let it spread from wherever it is. And in the case of a marine, here, I'll stand here so you guys see the flashing lights behind us. Look at that, that's very dramatic. Is that dramatic? Uh, very dramatic. So, um, so, uh, uh, so we, want to, we want to keep the um, oil uh, from going to new places. And in the case of this, since we're talking about offshore oil, we want to keep the oil from going onshore. And so we're going to use structures to contain the oil. Primarily the oil we're worried about is the floating oil. There will be a fraction of oil with, with, with a much longer chain, chain polymers that will sink. Weathered oil and more dense oil can sink. Um, we haven't talked about Deepwater Horizon, what happened with that yet, but actually in that, in that case, at that pressure and that depth, oil was negative. So oil, it wasn't possible for most oil to float at the bottom of the ocean in the Gulf of Mexico um, just because of basic physics. But, but for most oil like this, shallow water, this is a shallow water event, the oil is gonna float. And so therefore we're most concerned with the surface oil. So we'll deploy uh, of, of floating structures, things that are like device or a sausage with some wings that, that stick down in the water and, and give some additional depth. And so the, and those booms will only work when it is calm. If there are high seas, if it's super windy, booms pretty much don't do crap. So we one can deploy some booms out around the leak, the source of the leaks to try to contain it around there. We can also deploy booms over uh, next to structures. So if we're worried about the wetland, we can deploy it in front of the wetland. If we're worried about the mouth of the river, in front of the mouth of the river, that kind of stuff. Okay, so good. So now we, de now we deploy these things. Next thing is we want to get that oil out. So typically we're going to use some type of vacuum type technology, skimmer technology if we're out in the water with boats, but we're going to try to suck up that oil and get that separated from the water matrix and, 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 and get it out of here. Okay. Uh, uh, that's the first priority. That doesn't always work. Next priority, we've boomed. We've tried to suck up what we can suck up. Okay, now it's gotten to where we're worried about. It's gotten to the beach. It's gotten to the wetlands or whatever. So then the next thing there is uh, one option is to physically pick it up, right? To physically come here and, uh, and, and scoop the sand out, the oily sand matrix or whatever, and, and take it away. Or to scoop up the oiled, um, these guys are driving around me. You guys can still hear me okay, yeah? I'm assuming you guys can hear me. If you can't hear me, let me know. We can but, still um, hear you. Okay, good. Okay, so, um, okay, so, so uh, sometimes we, the best thing is just to scoop up the whole matrix, the oil and the sediment or soil, and remove all that material. Oftentimes, that has a lot of downsides, right? So if we think of our sandy beach, we're removing sand from our already oftentimes sand-starved beaches in Southern California. Um, we're worried about sea level rise, right? We want more sand on these beaches, we don't want less. Or we're worried about the, the critters, the organisms that are in that matrix, the worms, the sand crabs, whatever. And then uh, 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 the other thing is just, we might be worried that we're gonna be causing additional damage. The classic thing here would be our wetlands. So our wetlands are hurting. If we're gonna come in and rip up some of these this, this vegetation, take out the rhizome root matrix, that's going to be messed up, right? So there's downsides. Sometimes we have to because there's just so much oil or it's, it's so fresh or it's so bad, but, but that's a possibility. The, okay, now, now we jump to the, the next layer, which is the phase. We're not in this phase yet, but this might be the phase that we get to in a while. Um, so we, we've done our booming. We've done our content. We've, we've stopped the flow. We've done our booming. We've tried to do the initial skimming. Now the stuff is here. So the next approach is to try to make the oil less toxic through transformation. We have a cut, we have different options for transforming the oil to make it less toxic. First and foremost, I mean, it's a, it's a super overcast day right now. 
but I have my hat on because I'm bald, right? Bald professor dude, right? And so the bald professor dude wears a hat because because his his skin doctor guy says, don't get cancer, you stupid Irish dude, right? You got to wear a hat. So even on days like this, we have a significant amount of UV radiation. So even on days like this, which looks overcast and looks gray behind me, we still can have some significant uh, degradation rates of the oil that's deposited, say, on the, on the sandy beach here. And so a, br a bright, strong, sunny day, even more so. Um, uh, but what's going to transform that oil is exposure to air, um, agitation or, 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 or shaking up. So if we're on the surface of the ocean, um, you know, waves kind of bumping. Uh, 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 air and then UV radiation. Those are going to all act to chemically transform the oil. Then we can do some things where we try to, to scooch that process along even faster. So the, the most common thing we use in this context are dispersants. So this is just a fancy name for, for the, well, it's, it's not exactly that simple, but it, it's analogous to um, your, your dish detergent, your, your, dish, your dish soap in your, in your sink at home. So we add these detergents, these surfactants, and it's, right now the oil is super hydrophobic, right? The oil doesn't want to be in water, which is why it makes these big clumps and these big lumps. Um, uh, Zach, do you have a tar ball I can show real quick? Or can you grab one? Um, so, so anyway, so, so oil is going to stick to each, itself because it's hydrophobic. So what these dispersants are going to do, these dispersants are going to make it be less, um, less sticky to itself. And so, thanks, dude. Yeah. Okay. So, so well, we haven't talked about categories yet. So this is a cookie. We'll talk about cheese. So we'll talk about this in a second, but basically what's going on here is all this oil. Uh, I have a meeting today or whatever. Okay. All right. So, um, so this right here, right. All these molecules, all these little pieces of hydrocarbon are sticking to other pieces of hydrocarbon. It's sticking to itself, right? If I throw this in water, it's going to stay like this. Right? Make sure you guys can see this. It's going to stay like that, right? Okay. When we add these detergents, it's going to very quickly make this fall apart, and it's going to make um, each of these little oil molecules and their and their tails not stick to each other and, and not be attached to each other. Water will be able to form a cell. Will be able to form a, a nucleus around that, and then we can clean it up much easier. It won't stick to my the oil won't stick to my fingers as much. It's not gonna to stick to other oil molecules as much, and we can just simply break it up. We do that uh, primarily so that we can then have much faster microbial degradation of it. So the other category, so I mentioned this chemical transformation, then there's biological transformation. So biological transformation is mostly where we're hoping this oil ends up that is out here. And so these are, these are um, archaea, these are bacteria, and these are critters that are going to get in and actually directly consume these hydrocarbons. And so, and so that's, that, will, that will transform this oil from long chain toxic crap into biologically utilizable material. Okay. Then the, the last category we have to, to transform oil to, to try to make it less toxic is usually the worst. This is always on all these lists. You'll see Noah talking about it. Uh, uh, you know, there's all these things. It's very macho. It's very manly. Um, but burning, combustion. Combustion is basically BS. So combustion almost never works. Almost, almost, almost never works. So for oil combustion to work, we have to have, and so in, in a context like this, where we have oil on the ocean or water on the sort of sand, wet sandy beach right here, very hard. In the, in the movies, Arnold Schwarzenegger goes like, I'm going to stop you by the guy, right? You light the flare and throw it in and then boom. That's Hollywood, right? Almost impossible to ignite oil on water unless you, tr unless you have these very, very ideal conditions. What are those ideal conditions? No wind, absolutely dead calm. So if we look out right now, if we look out right now, um, it's, it's a pretty flat ocean. It, there's, there's, we're, we're, I'm not really having, experiencing any wind right here, we can see there's a little bit of there's a little bit of topographic complexity on on the ocean surface. We could probably burn this oil. If there's if there's a big oil slick right there, we could probably burn. But even this is a little marginal. You need almost glass. You need almost almost you know pristine lake flat 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 thing going on. Uh, and 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 if you have that, 
then you can you can ignite it as long as you pull together a huge amount of this oil so it gets really really thick they also use fuel to ignite the oil because if they just try to light the the oil that doesn't ignite um and uh so yes yeah, so you have to have the oil boom you have to have all these conditions right the other thing we discovered in the Deepwater Horizon, where we did, we tried to do a lot of combustion because there was so much oil. We actually have proof now that oil started in, say, off the coast of New Orleans. Those hydrocarbons were raining down in Atlanta. So we have definitive data, uh, chemical fingerprinting signatures that 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 transformed oil became uh, toxic soot, right? Went in the air, came around, and landed um, uh, inland. And so with all these things, with the exception of, of turning, off the, turning off the spigot, all of these things I've just been going through, the booming, the chemical treatment, everything, everything has a downside. Everything is a trade-off. Everything um, can cause some problem for some other critter or other situation. We're just trying to make the most efficient trade-off possible. Okay. Um, so, okay, so that, that's the approach. That's the approach. So there we go. So um, we're, we're probably going to... Uh, so right now there's some biological observers here. They're, they're starting to walk around the, the berm and check stuff. I wanna go over there and show you guys the berm real quick, just in case we get, we get pushed out. Um, but uh, uh, no, no so, I mean, does the gull have oil on him? No, he's just, it's just, uh, just his regular beak, but good, but good eye. Okay, so, um, so right here, I'm walking over towards the mouth of the river. So, this, so the, the rock structures here are, um, are always this way. Okay, actually, first, let me just do this right here. So I'm gonna look down at this tire track. Can you, you guys can see this, hopefully. So looking down this tire track right here, and you can see over here was just regular topographic. Over here was regular topographic. For whatever reason, this tire track was low. And so when the water was last at high tide, the water flowed into here, and you can see um, there's some tar in here, but there's also pieces of macrocystis, et cetera. All of this floating material has accumulated right in here, right? So it's a perfect example of, of how this stuff follows the hydrological discontinuities and can get, so, you know, we're, 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 several, we're several feet um, from, or not several feet, we're probably like, you know, 200 feet from the water's edge, 300 feet from the water's edge, but we have these pockets. So we have some plastics, we have plastic straws, we have some plastic waste, human uh, anthropogenic waste, oil, shells, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, somebody had a question? No, okay. Is it making sense, you guys? You guys able to see what I'm showing you guys? Everybody's asleep? Yeah, okay, good, okay, cool. All right, so I'm gonna keep walking over here. Okay, so now, now I'm walking. Uh, before this start, this construction started happening, I would be in the channel. So I'm, I'm, I'm physically in under, you know, storm flows, I would be in water right now. But so I'm walking this way. And what we've done is we've armored this side of the channel, okay? So we've put some type of, of strong engineered material. In this case, they're boulders, um, because we do not want, now historically, our systems were allowed to evolve and meander and change, right? So they were allowed to, to, to the mouth of the river was here, and then it went up to here, and then it went down over there, et cetera. We don't like that, right? So we decided as a society, that's too dangerous because we put a bunch of these super expensive houses right here, right? And then we have super expensive PCH right there. And we don't want to let, we don't want to let nature just take out PCH one year or take out these people's homes. So we fixed the channel. And so now I'm walking on these boulders. So now I'm walking on these boulders. And, um, and so, so, so this channel is here. All, and and there's, there's, there was just naturally occurring sand in the channel, right? And so what we've done here, as you can see, is we've taken some bulldozers and some excavators and we've shoved this sand up and we've made this, this relief, right? So again, it's about five feet. It looks actually be a bit higher than that now, but, but it's maybe more like eight, nine feet or so, maybe 10 feet even above the, the surrounding plane. And it's, uh, and they're going to probably be widening this today. We can see inland right here. We see this, that, that white thing. We'll go over and take a look at it in a second, but that's a boom, right? So that was the first thing they deployed. So before we did any of this manipulation, the, the emergency thing was, was put that floating structure in. 
and get that contained and then come and do this when we have some more time and can bring in the crews and physically transport the heavy equipment, et cetera. The other thing that we'll have when this stuff's going on in, in the US, not in other parts of the world, but in the US, is I don't know if you guys can see this, but right on the opposite side, can you see the dude climbing the, the berm over there? So that's, a, that's gonna be a biological observer. And so this person is going to be making sure that the construction crews don't accidentally drive over a nest, don't, don't, don't harass wildlife or stuff of that nature. Right here, that's our only, right here in Orange County, this particular spill, this particular location, that's our only other concern. In Refugio and other spills, we also have archaeological concerns. So there might be some human um, uh, uh, either, so in the case of Refugio, we had a lot of um, uh, Chumash, um, uh, uh, carvings and things of that nature on the rock surfaces we we're worried about. So we didn't want to have people just randomly go and, and clean all these rocks and scrape the oil off these rocks because there was some worry that they could be damaging some of these, this cultural heritage. So we had, we had um, you know, anthropological observers and representatives from our local tribes that were there as well, sort of hanging out, not doing the cleaning, but looking for possible problems and alerting people when they found something. So these types of monitors are, are important. Uh, it's not too crazy now, but also when we have large crews here working, there's right now, let's see where we are, there looks like there's one, two, three, four, maybe like five or six. Well, maybe there's some more construction guys up there. So maybe like call it like 10 or so, 10 or 15 city employees. Um, not a huge problem. Uh, they have mostly all have their own vehicles, but when we have large work crews, we typically hire to respond to this spill to pick up the tar. Those are basically usually kind of um, minimum wage type folks or relatively, um, you know, uh, uh, entry level workers type of things. And they're walking around in beekeeper suits and they're picking up oil. Those folks are out here for eight hours a day, maybe in the sun, maybe it's hot. So we might also have some observers that are checking for um, human safety, for worker safety as well. Um, but uh, yeah, that's what we have going on. So. Um, yeah, so, so we do have things like this. So this is an old deposition of, that's some old, old, super weathered oil um, that you'll get in places like this. Um, that's not from this, I doubt that's from the spill. That, that's probably way old, but, um, but yeah, so there we go. So that's, so that's this particular site. Um, right now, most of the activity seems to be a bit farther down and people are, are, are patrolling the beach and they're, they're, they're physically hand picking up these oh the next guy talked about the categories of how we classify the oil but but they're picking up the oil so we could have gone down there for the tour but this seemed to be more interesting from a management standpoint over there there there's there's more oil but it's just kind of people walking around and so this seemed to be more interesting so we decided to plop down here um so yeah i want to tell you about the 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 the, the oil that we get but do you guys have questions right now i've been i've been rambling do you guys have questions for me or anything we've talked about so far. How far does the oil permeate the sand? Okay, great question. So, so, so Kurt, I'm going to save that, and I'm going to um, uh, we'll talk about that when we talk about the categories of oil. Hey, Zach, can you grab me a, or do you have a, a cookie or two for me? Yeah. Um, and do you have a? Could you maybe, if there is one, do you have a fresher one and a more weathered one, or not really? Okay, I'm I'm just going to go. I'm just going to put this right here, you guys, so that I can use both my hands. And I will get to Kirk's question in a second. They're like a cookie, but they're very, I feel like that would be kind of fresh because it's still a okay. wet. Okay. Like oh, yeah, but it's a bit. Okay. So, um, all right, you guys. So, uh, oh, yeah. Okay. So, I'll talk about types of oil in a second, but, but were there other questions before we talk about oil types you guys had for me from the stuff we've just been talking about? No. Okay. So, um, so let's talk about, so we, we basically, we, there's a whole variety of many different ways we can classify oil. If we talk about um, some of the common oil on water surface, there's typically five or six broad categories that we, that we use to define, but they're, they're, they're hard for you guys to see. And, and... Oh God. <laughs> I guess there's a, a, an oiled whale somewhere around here. So, um, so yeah. 
uh, anyway, so uh, so Zach can go run it down, but 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 I'll talk about oil while they're trying to figure out what's going on with the oil, the whale. Um, so okay, so we have um, so so for 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 the this kind of spill, refugio type of spill, uh, 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 this Huntington Beach type of spill, is really three broad categories. Well, maybe four broad categories of oil that um, don't match exactly with with NOAA spill response and stuff. But I think from you guys, from a from a, a you know non oil spill expert standpoint, I think it makes sense. So uh, we have light. So we have the floating oil, the the, the liquid oil, right? Um, and we're going to have uh, while there's a continuum. In practical terms, there's really two broad ends of the spectrum. One is the ultra light material. This is stuff that's going to volatilize very quickly. This is this is basically jet fuel. This is um, very short length. Uh, stuff and 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 not a lot of other things other than the hydrocarbons themselves on one end of the spectrum very light floats very much so uh, 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 can barely see it if, if you put a little teeny bit on the surface of the water it'll spread out really quickly etc think of it like olive oil type of consistency okay the other category of floating oil are going to be our 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 longer chain our thicker our clumpy our um, in terms of hydrocarbon lingo, the more asphalt rich, the asphaltines. Remember when we talked about um, the Santa Barbara, uh, the, the oil deposits and seeps in Santa Barbara, we mentioned how, how we were, you know, initially had mines that we were just scooping out the asphaltines, more of that kind of stuff. So that's really thick, oozy, right? And, and that's more like, uh, like really cold maple syrup, right? Very, very congealed and very thick. Um, denser, much denser, uh, uh, and 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 that's going to tend to sink more. So the the light side of stuff is going to tend to evaporate and go into the atmosphere pretty quickly. The asphaltines will tend to not not do that very much and tend to stay in place. So we'll have thick, goopy oil and light, sort of salad dressy kind of oil on the water as it comes in and as it starts to encounter structures like sand. Etc. We we the oil will form what we call cookies. So I showed you a piece earlier. Here's a here's a little here's this is a, a super small piece, but you guys hopefully you can see this. But basically, um, it's it's essentially oil. It's not essentially oil. It is oil. It is oil that we've had all this sand, and this sand has just flown over it. It's bounced on to the oil. The oil has bounced through the sand. And it's stuck. It's it's like it's like a sticky piece of tape, and it's picked up all these particles of sand on the outside. And 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 then as it gets tumbled more, say in the surf, those pieces of sand get sort of pushed inside to the internal matrix, and eventually it makes an oily, sandy cookie. So the the term we use for these, the technical term, is a cookie. It's an oil cookie or a tar cookie. There. There, uh, again, there, there's many subcategories, but just we talk about the extremes. On one end will be stuff that's very much like uh, peanut butter, like, like, a, like an oily peanut butter type of consistency with a little bit of sand mixed in. We'd refer to that as fresh, a fresh cookie or fresh oiling. Uh, once that's been broken down more, weathered more, the, the, the components of the sand are more driving the texture and the feel, et cetera, of the, the piece of oil. And so that's gonna be a weathered cookie. And that's gonna be more like a, an actual oatmeal. So whereas, whereas the, the non-weathered one is gonna be more like a, a uh, we were making oatmeal cookies and we made the batter and you were scooping the batter and you just left the batter right there. The weathered is gonna be like, we took those oatmeal cookies, put them in the oven, baked them, took them out, and they're going to be more like that consistency. So you can pick it up. And you know, if I hold one edge of it, the rest of it will be sticking up in the air, right? But eventually, it might slowly start to bend. So, so uh, yeah, so, so, so th those are our categories. So we have uh, light and thick crude or light and thick oil on the water surface. And then as we come into shore, we tend to see this presented as cookies, and we have fresh versus weathered cookies. So mostly, so again, Zach and I just started walking around briefly before we started our lab uh, screencast here. 
so we're gonna we're gonna go around after this and and, and hunt around and, and see what we have in terms of um, abundances of oil. But by and large, what we're seeing, at least qualitatively so far, is mostly more of the um, moderately weathered. So stuff is still pretty fresh. But over the course of the next many days and weeks, that that those cookies will tend to become more and more weathered, and they'll tend to become more and more hard and 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 oatmeal cookie like as we go through time. So um, so then I think Kurt's question was how how or whoever's question I can't remember who how how deep does the oil go right was I think that was the question. And the answer is it's going to depend. It's going to depend on a bunch of things. If it's raining and we, you know, we're up here on this dune and we get some oil deposited and then it rains a lot and it's relatively fresh, that oil can be mobilized and can be pulled, you know, much farther down into the oil. I mean, into the sand, excuse me. Uh, what does is, what is farther down mean? It's going to totally depend. Maybe, you know, anywhere from many inches to, you know, some, uh, some feet. And if it was a lot of oil for a long period of time, even deeper than that sometimes. Um, the, the oily sheen that we get, if it's just a sheen and not, not sort of agglomerated oil, um, that's mostly going to tend to stay on the surface. Um, unless we have really, really intense, unless we have oil being dumped upon oil being dumped upon oil being dumped to clarify again, I, I said this before, but just to reiterate, this is, this is a bad oil spill. This is problematic. This is not good. This, we shouldn't have this happening, but in the grand scheme of things, this is not a particularly horrible oil spill, right? There, there, there are, uh, we've had many worse conditions in this. And importantly, we've stemmed the flow of oil. So to answer Kurt's, or to answer the question about how far does oil get, it's not just when the oil arrives, but how much oil pressure do we have? We, we have a chunk arriving with this tide, the chunk arriving with next tide, and the next tide, that'll tend to push the depth of the oil exposure much deeper. Um, as we have it now, it's more, ephemeral right so it's like oh a dollop of oil will come in on this tidal cycle and then maybe nothing for a day or two maybe a little more the next day and so that's going to act to have the oil relatively contained to the shallow surface of the sand uh area um and so you know not not a huge uh depth signal i would i would guess of this oil other questions you guys have Other, other just general questions about the spill, maybe not stuff I've talked about, but other things you guys are wondering about in terms of um, what's been going on down here, what we're seeing. Um, I was curious. So I know like the media has been asking you a lot of questions. I wonder like what kind of questions they ask you. Oh, good question. Yeah. So the number one question I get, well, I should ask Chase, Chase, what's the number one question you want to ask me? They want to ask what the media is asking. Well, I'm really curious, as we discussed on the phone, about how you're expecting this to play out over the long term. So what the sand crops in this area, how that's going to impact things potentially, you know, the particulate matter from the oil, how that's going to kind of maybe be staying, or is it going to be staying in this area? And what maybe like things will look like three years down the line from now because of your experience. Sure, sure. Years, so that's my... Inquest, inquest. Yeah, so I would, I would say so. So, so Ch I hope you guys could hear Chase right there saying so. Uh, yeah, so so those are I say that that's the most common broad category, which is what is this oil spill likely doing right now, ecologically, environmentally, and then two is is uh, what's that going to mean over the long term? So this means we're going to have endangered species. This means we're going to have uh, you know fewer fish. This means these fish are going to make people sick if they eat them. Those kind of questions. And, and so that, that's, I'd say that's the vast majority of the questions I'm getting are related to that. Second most common category of questions I'm getting are, um, what did we learn from the refugio spill since that seems to be a, 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 a good model for, or at least similar to what's going on here. So, um, so, so that is the next category. And then when we, we have conversations, um, usually, uh, and they ask me, is there anything else I wanna talk about or anything else? Um, I, I really think um, I try to, at least mention to them the socioeconomic impact of this. So if you guys can see right now, Zach's sitting there, Chase's in there. So, so, so there's the lifeguard tower there, empty. Lifeguard tower there, empty. Um, way over there, we can see the pier. You guys, I don't even know if you can see it on the, on the uh, white balance on the camera, but basically nobody's here, right? Now it is a, we're, we're talking midweek in the early part of the fall. 
right? So most of the kids are in school and you guys are in your college classes and all that kind of good stuff. But there still should be some old geezers, right? This is Orange County. My God, there's a lot of orange old geezers here, right? So there should be a lot of people hanging out, walking their dog, right? Getting their, getting their tans and, and fishing and, uh, you know, all the things people do on the beach. It's not, it's not a July 4th weekend, but still there should be lots of people. There's nobody here with the exception of us and a, a, a few random other looky-loos. Um, there aren't people with their kids recreating, et cetera. And so it also means people are not, are not in the restaurants by and large and not, and not getting hotel rooms and, and on and on and on. And so, so the socioeconomic impact is also, as I think probably likely to be more problematic, um, it, it, it will be generally speaking of this oil spill will probably be relatively short lived on the order of a few weeks or month or two. But given that we have COVID, COVID, many of these businesses are barely hanging on. So this might be well be enough to just shove these, you know, folks that are on the margin hung, hanging on by their fingertips off. So we, I, I try to make sure the media at least um, has a thought about that. And then the other one that I've been trying to bring up is this idea of, um, of stressors and how um, we need to think as we're talking about in our class, right? Hopefully this, this, this is all makes total sense to you guys, but um, you know, we're getting stressor on top of stressor on top of stressor on top of stressor, right? So those folks are just saying, have you seen the oiled whale, right? So if we just had an oiled whale, that would suck, right? But it'd be, oh, bad, bummer, there's an oiled whale. But we have um, over-harvested whale populations in a warming ocean where the food support for a lot of these critters has been stressed. And we have, you know, this... Uh, um, oil spill. And so, so this oil spill, rather than be, I think, I think the tendency, it's natural, it's not nefarious, but it's natural for, for the media or whoever to talk about this event, right? Because this is, this is the unfolding news story. Let's get this. Let's talk about this. And that's important. But if we can, if we have time or the space or the, or the freeboard in the story, I think it's important to also, you know, talk about, we need to come up with some different approaches to managing these, these crises, right? That acknowledge that, you know, there's some people that are suffering from the last disaster and the one before that and the one before that. And so we maybe need some different skill sets. And if we only have, if we're only responding to a oil spill in a pristine environment, does that make sense? You guys, those are the kind of things I'm talk we're talking about. Other questions, anything else you guys are wondering about? Awesome. Okay. So uh, given that we've been going for about 45 minutes, uh, so I think we've seen most of what we can see here. Um, I'm gonna, I'll walk around and take some photos and stuff and we'll get some drone footage and stuff. So I'll have additional shots from today that I would like you guys to look at just to highlight different elements of stuff that, that's going on with the response. But um, I think for us, that's probably gonna be good as far as our, our quick and dirty, what's going on with the Huntington Beach oil spill as of uh, uh, today. Um, I would direct you to, um, I haven't put these links in the, in our readings yet. I was going to save them for next week, but, um, if you're just looking around, I would say, um, there's some overall, I think some of the best reporting is being done out of the LA times right now. They've really honed in on, um, there's a lot of good reporting all over the place, but, but, but in particular, the LA times seem to have really been honing in on the drivers of this, the, the history of the company, um, that owns the platforms. Now we're talking about what seems to be happening is is it seems likely that the COVID pandemic, which screwed up our delivery supply chains, et cetera, led to these tankers, not so many tankers. I don't, I didn't check now, but last weekend, right, there were 72 tankers waiting to get into the harbor of the, the port of LA Long Beach. They've never had that slow a backup before. And we filled up the parking lots, right? So all the places where the boats typically anchor uh, were filled up. And so they were moving into new places it seems like maybe that's what actually caused the spill. So one of these ships dropped anchor, the anchor, the, the ship or something, there was some dragging going on. We hooked this pipeline, which is going from one platform to another, another uh, onshore um, um, facility, drug it for a long ways. And indeed it appears to be ripped a 13 inch gash in it with the anchor or some of the structure, anchoring structure. And so that appears to be what actually caused this um, spill. Again, we don't, that's not definitive, but that, that's what the, the, the scuttlebutt is. And so if that's, if that's the case, right, that's, 
that's the pandemic leading to an oil spill, right? So all kinds of other things we can add to the craziness and unfortunateness of this horrible global pandemic. But, but, um, but uh, so I'll have some readings on that. I'll have some suggested readings for you guys next week. But if you're just curious, I would check out the LA Times. Um, they have good stuff coming out all, all the time there. Um, so that, that's a good source uh, for updates. And the governor just had a big press conference yesterday. I think there's another press conference this morning, or maybe it's already started. That's probably going to update numbers and things of that nature. But, um, but yeah, cool. Other questions or any, any last questions you guys have? Okay, then I am going to kill our recording.